Code at Arms is one of the few first-person shooters exclusive to the PSP, and it's the game I got requested to play most when I said I was going to do a PSP month. But is Code at Arms just a novelty? I mean, the PSP wasn't made for first-person shooters. I've never played it before, so I guess let's find out. Hey everyone, as always, Jarek here. Now, I didn't expect this game to be this interesting or unique. I expected a linear first-person shooter. Instead, what I got is a procedurally generated roguelike first-person shooter on the PSP, of all things. This game was also developed by Konami? Man, this was back when they actually cared about video games and weren't busy screwing over Silent Hill. Good times. Anyway, before I really get into it, I need to thank today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is NordVPN. If you watch this channel, you probably enjoy video games. That seems like an obvious assumption. But what can NordVPN do for you if you are gaming? Well, what if a game isn't available in your location? What if you want to join your friends in a region lock server across seas? What if you want to get discount deals available in other locations? No problem, just change where you are. At least according to the internet, NordVPN can make the internet think that you're in a totally different location across the world. There are 5,200 different servers across 60 countries. Well, okay, now you have your game, but VPNs do more than just allowing you to get them. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and this is great for privacy. This means that you can avoid DDoS attacks, which is really important if you're streaming. You can block malware-ridden websites, you can secure browser traffic without affecting legacy, and all this is under a next-generation encryption. If you want to try this out for yourself, NordVPN has provided a special deal for my viewers. Go to nordvpn.com slash to get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash or just use my code Jarek at checkout or you can click that link down below in the video information or pinned comment. Once again, a big thanks goes to NordVPN. They provide a product that just sort of benefits everyone involved, so it's great to have them involved with my channel. I'm also doing another giveaway for Dread Templar. It's a good game, and I want people to play it. All you have to do to enter is subscribe, like, and comment. The comment doesn't have to be anything specific. I will pick the comment I like most, and then send you your key through Discord or Twitter or whatever is easiest for you. Okay, Coded Arms. Let's start with the story. Coded Arms takes place in the late 21st century, where technology has advanced to the point to allow humans to connect their minds to computer networks. Of course, with this type of technology, there was a huge boom in hackers. The entire game takes place inside of a virtual reality military training simulator called Ada. Ida? Anyway, it's been long abandoned, but the program still continues to run, and there is a lot of information in there to pull out. What do you get out of doing that? Well, fame and profit. In order to get this information, you need to go deep inside of different sectors to reach the kernel database. However, the game warns the player right at the beginning that hacking this deep into unknown non-civilian protocols can cause something called Akiba Syndrome. And upon infection, they will not be able to return. Effectively, this means your consciousness is trapped in this program and you can't get back to your real body. The presentation of the story is pretty nice. Right at the very beginning, there's a pretty moody intro that explains everything going on with some great music. This is well-polished stuff that you wouldn't expect to see on a handheld back in 2005. With that said, nothing really happens from the intro to the end. It's basically just the start of the story and the end of the story. In fact, aside from the cutscenes at the beginning and end of the game, there's no others. Aside from if you include a cutscene showing up bosses, but I don't know if that really counts. And so we move on to the graphics, which immediately I have to say that I am recording this on an emulator and I'm rendering this at 1920 by 1088, so almost 1920 by 1080. It's going to look a lot clearer in this video than on the original PSP, but at the same time, the original PSP has a much smaller screen, so maybe it balances out. Anywho, the lore behind the game is rather cliche. We're in a simulation, we're hackers. I mean, we've seen this many times before, but the presentation does a pretty good job showing it off in game. The environment has this slight blurry twitchiness to it that just looks like a hologram. And every time you open a door going into a room you haven't been in before, it materializes in front of you. The textures are pretty high detail for what this is. The weapons have pretty okay animations. The animations for the enemies are pretty well done. I know what's going on. I know when they're about to attack me. The reload animations are smooth. The sound effects are loud and punchy. This is some pretty high quality stuff for a PSP. 
The only downside is that it runs at 20 FPS. Yeah, it has a 20 FPS lock. If they could have just targeted 30 instead, that would have been a lot nicer. Like, this doesn't make it unplayable, and it is a PSP, so... I mean, you have limitations, but man, playing at 20 FPS is kind of hard to ignore. They clearly push fidelity over frame rate, and I guess when you're playing on a smaller screen, you wouldn't notice as much. The same thing can be said for the FOV. It's very tight, but also this was not intended to be played at a monitor only a few feet away. This was made to be played in your hands on a small screen that would take up a smaller bit of your vision. So in this case, the FOV actually makes sense. So overall on a tech level, this is actually really impressive for a handheld in 2005. This is something I would have expected to see on a full console release, not on a handheld. And to top it all off, the music in this game is really good. It fits the virtual reality aesthetic they were going for, and it's just nice to listen to. The music is also varied enough to where you're not listening to the same track the whole game. And speaking of the whole game, it's pretty long. It'll take a while for you to beat it. But before you can even start playing, I gotta talk about these controls. Now it has the basic PSP FPS control scheme you would expect. Left analog stick moves you around, face buttons you aim with. It also has some pretty hefty aim assist, thank god. But even with all this stuff, man, the controls are bad in this game. I played for a little bit using the default controls just to get the experience to see how it would feel, and it felt really bad. The aiming was a lot worse than Nova, and it was pretty difficult to hit anything. And then I decided to change the controls so I could try to make it work like a regular first-person shooter. See, one of the other control schemes makes the left analog stick the aiming control stick, and the face button's what you use to move. Then I went into the emulator and rebound the face buttons to the analog stick, and rebound the left analog stick to the right analog stick so I could have regular first-person shooter controls. Problem is, it wasn't really made for analog stick aiming. The aim felt hideous when I did this. I played for a little bit trying to get used to it and trying to figure out why it felt so bad, and then I went deeper into the controls and found that the aim acceleration is just so awful for analog sticks. Yeah, this was very clearly made for face buttons, and once I started messing with this, it started feeling a lot better, but it never really felt good. To make things even worse, this game is entirely CQB, and a lot of the enemies are going to move very quickly. To make it even, even worse, the aiming in this game has weird mechanics behind it. You see that big circle? That's the sort of aim assist circle that kind of tracks the opponent. That's not really where your bullets are going. Where your bullets are going is the smaller crosshair within that. There's also a heavy amount of bloom. If you're walking, your shots are going to be very inaccurate. And when I say very inaccurate, I mean, imagine if you had just dumped 10 rounds without trying to pace your shots at all with the Halo Reach DMR, and that's what every shot feels like if you're moving and shooting. You're not hitting anything. So basically the only way to shoot opponents is to completely stand still. You also kind of have to wait for the crosshair to float over to the enemy anyway so you can actually shoot them. I think the easiest way to figure out how the crosshair works is to see it jumping around and you hold the trigger down with the assault rifle. This becomes a huge problem later on when you have enemies constantly throwing grenades at you and doing things that would be difficult to avoid even while you could shoot while moving. But since you have to stand completely still to hit them, your option is take damage to kill them or possibly end up dying yourself, or just keep strafing around the enemy completely wasting your ammo and not hitting anything. This is by far the biggest downside of this game. Controls are bad and the aiming mechanics make no sense. This is a game that really feels like it was trying to be not just a full console game, but actually a full PC game. If this released as an indie game with keyboard and mouse support, it might end up working perfectly fine in this regard. Although I would still hate the blue mechanics, I generally hate them in almost any game I play, with very few exceptions. So yeah, the controls are an utter failure. This is the biggest complaint I have, but thankfully that doesn't translate to the gameplay itself, which is pretty good for a PSP. So as I said at the beginning of this video, every single level is procedurally generated. And this is more than just the levels themselves. The upgrades, the weapons, the ammo, the enemies, Everything is totally random. And there's a lot of content here too. This game is going to take you at least seven or eight hours to beat, probably more. Your progression in the game is tied to sectors. Sector zero consists of a tutorial and three levels that serve to further the tutorial, so not really much of a level. Sector one consists of three different areas, city, base, and ruins. Each of these areas has six levels. In city, you're fighting robots. In base, you're fighting soldiers. And in ruins, you're fighting bugs? Bit of an odd choice, and honestly everything in this game is sort of just an odd texture salad mixture of things, but it kind of works. Anyway, Sector 2 also has three areas, both being city, base, and ruins. 
except now every one of these has 13 levels and this takes quite a while to beat all 13 levels. They also each have their own boss. To give you an idea of how much content is in this game, after four and a half hours, I had only gone through one of the areas in Sector 2 and beaten one of the bosses. I still had the two other areas, both having 13 levels and their own boss to beat. At that point, you have basically beat the game, but there is one more sector. This sector is Infinity, which has an unlimited amount of levels to it. Basically, this just means you can play the game forever as long as you want. This is just, you have your stuff, you want to keep playing the game, feel free. So there are different factions of enemies, which means you get different types of weapons. These mostly consist of either energy weapons or regular firearms. Surprisingly, these feel pretty good. As I said, they have good animations, good sound design, good feedback for a first person shooter on a PSP. They all also are going to be better depending on what you're shooting at. For example, energy weapons are better at getting rid of robots. And while yes, you do get the generic pistol, the generic shotgun, the generic assault rifle, all are pretty fun to use, but you get a lot more interesting weapons as well. You get a grenade launcher, which launches napalm, which has surprisingly good looking fire for a PSP in 2005. Oh my lord. You also get another variant of that grenade launcher, which is good against robots. I also found out that you can do a backpack reload in this game. As long as you start reloading, if you swap weapons, that gun is immediately reloaded. So you can really start spamming grenades this way. This unfortunately means you need to like claw or something to do because in order to swap weapons, it's on the D-pad. So you have to let go of your moving analog stick to do that. Still, you can make it work, but then you also get other interesting weapons like a pulse rifle that you can charge up and shoot or a giant beam, which reminds you of that one gun for Time Soldiers 2 that I'm forgetting the name of. And since this game is randomly generated, you'll get these guns at total random. There's no predicting when you get what gun. This means you're going to end up with an inventory full of guns and different equipment. You can change out these weapons out of your inventory whenever you want to though, and you can actively have five at any given time. You also can find gear for your head, chest, and legs to increase defense and other stats like that. In the actual map, you will find random upgrade markers. Pick up enough of these while you're carrying a certain gun and that gun will upgrade. This mostly means that that gun is going to do more damage now, and it is vital that you pick these up and make sure you upgrade certain guns. A low level gun is not not going to do you any good against a boss. But this presents problems because like I said, everything is randomly generated, including the ammo. So if you put all of your upgrade points into the shotgun and the assault rifle, but you just can't get ammo for them, you're gonna have a really hard time. And of course, if the maps are randomly generated and so are the enemies, you might run into a few rooms that are really difficult. So while the randomly generated thing is a good thing, it also is kind of a bad thing and it could have been done a lot better. That said, the one thing that isn't random are the bosses, which are pretty awesome. These things are huge, have big health bars, and didn't feel unfair to me. Maybe because I was just abusing the backpack reload more than I should have. But I mean, still, these were fun. Coded Arms is a very interesting game. I've heard a wide range of opinions involving it, Something along the lines of, I found it incredibly boring, which in all fairness, it does get really repetitive. But I've also heard opinions of it just being the best game on the PSP. It has a bit of a cult following, and I understand both opinions. It's not a flawless game, and it can be severely flawed in the wrong situation. But also, it's really unique, and there's nothing else on the PSP like it. In fact, if this game came out today on PC as some indie game, I could see a ton of people loving it. Apparently the second game got rid of the RNG aspect and made it more of a regular first person shooter. I'm really curious how that plays out. So that's what I'm gonna cover next week. For now, I think that's all I have to say. Wanna give a big thanks to everyone that joined me over on Twitch. My Twitch is twitch.tv slash Jared4GamingDragon. If you subscribe, you get to see my videos at least a week ahead of time. Also wanna give a big thanks to my sponsor, NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com slash Jarek to get your own deal. And of course, a huge thanks goes to you for watching this video.